Being successful at Eurovision often means more than just having a good song. Of course, there's a few notable exceptions, but in a field of 26 entries in the grand final, it's usually the added extras that help an act get closer to the crown. And whilst there's been plenty of notable staging gimmicks over the years, there's definitely some that have done better than others. So today we're going to be honouring some of the times where a staging idea hurt a song more than it helped. My name is Chris and here are six staging gimmicks that flopped at Eurovision. Now just before we start, obviously these are just my personal opinions as well, so do keep that in mind. However, do let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments section as well. So starting off, number one, Germany 2009, Dieter von Tees. Dieter von Tees is arguably one of the most, if not the most, well-known burlesque performers of the modern day. So when Germany announced that she would be part of their Eurovision 2009 performance, there was a lot of reason to be excited. What kind of performance would the risque star bring to the Eurovision stage? Well, that's where things immediately ran into some problems. Eurovision is still very much a family show. I know that for me personally, it was the one night a year when I was younger, I was allowed to stay up past my bedtime. And I know it's the same for a lot of other people. So whilst Germany's performance might have been scheduled to be later on in the running order, the EBU was obviously still nervous about just what might be on show. Those fears were apparently realized in the rehearsals when Dieter was pictured with Diamante nipple tassels on display. Germany's performance was reined in, and on the Saturday night, it was more like a case of where's Wally than a true Dieter performance. While she still got an epic entrance, it felt like Dieter wasn't even really there. And because her part in the performance had been hyped so much, it meant that it felt like a bit of a letdown. Germany ended up finishing 20th on the leaderboard, and it really is a case of what might have been with Dieter's performance had it gone through as they had originally planned. Number two, North Macedonia 2015, Blackstreet, or MERJ. In 2015, North Macedonia found itself with a bit of a problem. Daniel K. Mikoski won Skokiefest and was all set to go to Eurovision with his entry, Lysia SN Ski. Fun fact, Daniel actually beat Tamara Tedeska at Skopje Fest that year, and boy, did that work out well for their futures at Eurovision. It was decided that things had to change before Daniel hit the stage in Vienna. First of all, Lisa Esenski changed into the decidedly slower and arguably less impactful Autumn Leaves. Like the autumn leaves. But that wasn't all that had to change. Enter 90s R&B group Blackstreet. They hit the charts with songs like No Diggity, Fix and Take Me There. But as with all bands, multiple lineup changes and bad blood meant that they ended up going their separate ways. Three of the members ended up forming their own group called MERJ. But how does all that affect Eurovision, I hear you ask? Well, maybe that's a question North Macedonia should have asked. Inexplicably, MERJ became Daniel's backing singers for Vienna, except their very presence seemed to overshadow his performance. Watching the rehearsals, it became clear that something wasn't quite working. And unfortunately, what wasn't working was MERJ. It feels like they were promised a much more prominent role than just being backing singers. They linger in shots, they loom over Daniel, they keep on getting in the way. Now, to be fair, Daniel played the role of supporter really well. He even said that they were one of his idols because apparently No Diggity was a huge hit in North Macedonia. And even though Daniel was vocally really strong and the song still had its merits, there was just too much going on to help it out. North Macedonia failed to qualify once again, finishing 15th in the semi-final. It's especially a shame because Daniel really wasn't at fault here. He was really passionate about Eurovision and hopefully he will get another shot at some point to show off just how good he could be. Number three, Luxembourg 1980, a penguin suit. Here he comes. Yes, it's everybody's favorite kooky German uncle, Ralph Siegel. If you don't know who Ralph Siegel is, well, let me fill you in. Ralph has composed 24 Eurovision songs, including a winner, multiple runner-ups, and third place songs as well. They have ranged from the sublime to the ridiculous. At Eurovision 1980, Ralph was responsible for two songs, both of which had, oh, let's say memorable staging. 
Jim Lee's catcher Ebstein would go on to challenge for the victory with Teata that year, even in spite of the weird performers who joined her on stage. But for this list, we're going to be focusing on his other entry that year, Luxembourg. French twins Sophie and Magali had been signed by Siegel and would perform the light pop song Papa Pinguin. Unfortunately for them, the duo would not be alone on stage. The performance begins and oh god, what is that? Yes, that would be Papa Pinguin himself. Now sure, it's perhaps thematically appropriate for the song to have a penguin on stage, but that right there, that's the stuff of nightmares. And to be fair, you could say that Luxembourg didn't flop. After all, they did finish ninth in the end, which is the highest of any song that is on this list. But that's before you know that the record of Papa Pinguin would go on to sell over a million copies. There's definitely reason to think that they could and maybe should have done better. And really, the only thing stopping it was the staging. If you compare a man in a penguin suit to the subtlety of the 1980 winner Johnny Logan, you can see why juries maybe didn't want to reward Luxembourg so much. Sophie and Magali could have been left on stage to really give it their all and sell the song by themselves. They certainly had the ability to do so. But in the end, they were saddled by a man in a penguin suit. And to be honest, that's what the lasting memory of this performance is and not the actual artists. Number four, Armenia 2019, Disappearing Audience. There was plenty of excitement when Armenia announced Sir Book would be their artist for Eurovision 2019. Eurovision fans were hopeful that this would harken back to the glory days of Sarusho and Ava Rivas, times when Armenia were right at the top of Eurovision. But the response to her song, Walking Out, was perhaps a little more muted than expected. But the music video had strong visuals, and maybe that was a sign of things to come at Eurovision for her staging. Well, not exactly. During rehearsals, it just felt like there was something missing, a spark that could really lift the performance up. I know that from being in the press room, there were plenty of people who wondered whether Armenia would even qualify. Maybe though, Sabuk needed a live audience. That would be what would lift her through on the night. So as the semi-final began and her performance kicked in, we were all waiting and watching and hoping, and then the crowd disappeared. Now again, this probably did fit the song's message. The audience had apparently walked out. But that's not really a great selling point for a performance. It read more as, oh, this song isn't very good and the audience all left in protest, as opposed to, oh, well, this is really fitting for the song's title. It was confusing. I remember watching it live and thinking, did the feed go out rather than, oh, isn't that a clever idea? In the end, that trick did not help at all. Sabuk finished 16th, which is Armenia's worst ever performance in a Eurovision contest. It's a real shame given the hope that was initially behind her, but this is definitely a case where going too literal with your staging really does not help. Number five, Spain 2008, Bad Backup Dancer. It felt like there was something in the water at Eurovision 2008. There were gimmicks and props aplenty, with Ireland sending a literal puppet onto the stage, whilst France's performance saw Sebastian Tellier drive onto stage in a golf cart, accompanied by a beach ball filled with helium and bearded singers. Now sure, neither of those songs did particularly well, but what we're going to be talking about is another entry from 2008 that tried a gimmick that really didn't pan out. Rodolfo Chiquilla Quatre is a comedy character who won the Spanish national final in a landslide. And whilst the song itself was set up for laughs in Spanish, there was another trick up Rodolfo's sleeve, his backing dancers. Yes, Rodolfo wasn't just playing for laughs with the song, but physical comedy too. The two main dancers squabble and try to steal the limelight from each other. One even shoves the other early on in the performance. Tonya Harding, eat your heart out. And there's plenty of pratfalls too. The problem is, it might be funny, but it's pretty juvenile humour at best. What's more, there's so much going on that on first watch, you might not even notice what's happening, even when the camera is trying to focus on the dancers. Even now, if you look at the comments on the video for Baila El Chiqui Chiqui, everybody's talking about Rodolfo trolling Eurovision with his song, but nobody really mentions the performance. It feels like a fail that it isn't more noticeable, and that songs like France and Ireland have endeared themselves way more to Eurovision fans over the years, even though they got less points on the night. It feels like an in-joke that was particularly related to Spain, and that just doesn't work at a global contest. And finally, number six, Russia 2018, The Mountain. 
After missing out on Eurovision 2017 due to the ongoing tensions with Ukraine, Russia returned for Eurovision 2018. And once more, they selected Yulia Samoylova, their 2017 act, as their artist. Now, it's fair to say that there was some apprehension going into 2018 how Russia would choose to portray Yulia's disability on the stage. And full disclosure, I don't know the reasons why the staging team decided to do what they did. I can have my ideas and theories, but all we can really talk about here are the facts. And the facts are that they decided to put Yulia at the top of a polystyrene mountain towards the back of the stage, hiding her wheelchair and barely making her a focal point of her own Eurovision performance. All people could really see was the mountain. It became known as Mount Samoylova by fans. To make matters worse, the camera would often linger on the dancers who also formed part of the performance. At one point during rehearsals, there was a shot that didn't show Yulia for over a minute, even in her own Eurovision performance. And sure, Yulia's vocal performance wasn't particularly great at all, but can you really blame her? If you were being treated as an afterthought, would you really want to or be able to give it your all? Russia failed to qualify to nobody's surprise. Yulia was left with a black mark against her name that really wasn't justified. This is a case where the staging completely overshadowed everything else in the performance, and that's what really let this one down. It wasn't Yulia's fault, it was the people behind her. Now believe me, there are plenty more examples of staging ideas and gimmicks that have flopped at Eurovision, but there's only so many I can cover at one time. If you think I've missed any out, let me know down in the comment section below, and maybe there will be another video looking at some more of them in the future. I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to everybody who has subscribed and liked and commented so far. I think at the time of filming this, I'm just shy of 200 subscribers already, which is just absolutely unbelievable. I can't believe just the support that I've had. So really, it means so much. Thank you all. If you have enjoyed this video, again, please do subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell, leave a like, comment. I would love to know what your thoughts are. That's all for now. And until the next video, I will see you later. Bye.